So today's webinar will be uploaded to YouTube. So if you have to step out during today's presentation, um, hopefully by tomorrow, you'll be able to find it on YouTube. So today we're talking about Wi-Fi 101. So we're taking a look at um, Wi-Fi itself. We're going to start off with sort of the technology background and roughly how the technology works. Um, from there, we'll get into um, you know some best practices when it comes to deployment. Um, we're going to save it till the end, and at the end here, we're going to talk a little bit more specifically about Wi-Fi 6 and Wi-Fi 6E. Um, so that will be later on towards the end. Um, we'll start here with a single slide, just showing a little bit of background on who Zycel is, in case you haven't uh, been here before. And for some reason, PowerPoint is not advancing my slides. It says it is, but they're not actually advancing. Okay, this is embarrassing. Give me a second. Okay, I'm back. I apologize for that. Um, Excel had completely crashed on me and wouldn't advance the slide. So we've restarted it and I think we're good to go. Um, so we'll start with just a little background on who Zycel is. So Zycel has been making networking equipment for over 30 years. We got started all the way back in 1989. Um, at this point in time, we, have a, we serve 150 different global markets and we've deployed over 100 million devices. Um, for North America, the headquarters is based out of Anaheim, California. That's our sales. That's our warehouse, marketing, and our tech support. So when you call in, even for tech support, you are dealing with our Anaheim office. For those of you on the East Coast, if you call in early in the morning, um, it will be transferred to our German office. But again, that is the Zycel German office. It is not outsourced support from a third-party company. Um, and then our headquarters itself is based out of Taiwan. So now we'll start talking about the Wi-Fi basics. Oh, and I forgot to add, um, if you have any questions as we go through today, send them in using the question and answer box. I can see that as we go through and hopefully I can answer the questions um, as they come in. Um, for some of the more complex questions, I may need to um, punt those down towards, towards the end of the presentation to be able to answer those. But send them in with that. I cannot see chat um, until we get to the end. So Q&A is the best way to tell me it's about something. So we'll start by talking about the timeline. And the timeline, timeline here is kind of important. Um, so I've got the different dates here. You can see um, Wi-Fi itself first became a thing all the way back into 1997. Now, this is important because it shows you just how old the under underpinnings are, the architecture that goes into 802.11. As you know, 802.11 products are fully backwards compatible, which means they need to be backwards compatible with the original version of the of the uh, standards, which came out in 1997, or possibly um, with 802.11 A and B, which were uh, came out in 1999. Um, so, I mean, think back to 1997. That was the era of dial-up internet. If you were rich and lived in a technology uh, progressive space, maybe you could get an ISDN connection if you were willing to pay hundreds of dollars a month. Um, for something that was, I believe, what was that, 128 dedicated, 128 kilobits per second connection. Um, or you could get a T1 if you had thousands of dollars a month, and that was 1.5 megabits per second connection. Um, the average hard drive back then was less than two gigabytes in size. So it gives you an idea that, you know, back then, networking is not the same as today. 
where you can easily stream a movie and transfer four um, four gigabytes of data or more easily on that stream. I guess some of the HD streams now are probably what 10, 15 meg size uh, files, um, depending on how aggressive they get with the encoding on those. Um, and as you can see, as technology went along, um, we got G and et cetera. Now, one thing here that is kind of uh, fuzzy is some of these dates here. These dates are based either on when this technology was certified or ratified the standard or when it was published. Um, and if you've been doing Wi-Fi for a while, you know that um, there are products that come out on the market that claim to be based on one of these standards that predate when the standard was actually finally ratified. Um, and you know that's just pushed along by technology companies' desire on the chipset side of things to create and sell new chips. And on the uh, the end user side, you know, end users are always wanting the latest and greatest. So therefore, uh, manufacturers are always looking to pump out the latest and greatest, even if that means getting ahead of the standard. So for instance, you know, 802.11ax um, came out roughly around 2021. Um, However, you saw products coming out claiming to be Wi-Fi 6 up to, you know, probably 18 months before that. With 11N, we had those, those pre-11N products and the 802.11G plus products um, that filled that six-year gap between the two. Um, so that's just something to keep in mind that these dates, um, these are the publishing dates of the standard, but products sometimes claiming these things come out before um, the actual standards get ratified, and sometimes that causes trouble. For instance, a lot of the pre-11N products that launched um, claimed that they were going to be firmware upgradable to the full 11N, or 11N standard, and yet when that standard finally came out, um, it turned out that there were some features that could not be added with software, so many of those pre-11N products were never able to be upgraded to 11N, and we've seen similar things on some of the other technologies through here. Um, with 802.11ac, we saw that rolled out as two different quote-unquote waves, where Wave one only came out with some of the feature set of the 802.11 AC standard. And then several years later, a wave two, which could support the full feature set um, that was part of um, 11 AC. And we see something similar with Wi-Fi 6, um, where with Wi-Fi 6 products, they don't necessarily support all of the Wi-Fi 6 features. Uh, in fact, a lot of the products that came out before the standard was ratified don't and can never be upgraded to have them. And some of the new lower cost Wi-Fi 6 chips are missing some of those features. The Wi-Fi Alliance itself, which we'll talk a slightly a little bit more about here in the next slide, um, they only added some of the features to their certification program um, in early 2022. Um, again, long after the, the standard came out. So that's something to keep in mind. Um, unlike 11AC, where you had wave one, wave two, the industry has decided to make no differentiation between Wi-Fi 6 products that support all the features and Wi-Fi 6 uh, products, which only support some of the features. And then coming out here in the near future is going to be Wi-Fi 7. So I can answer some questions on Wi-Fi 7 when we get to the end here. But the really interesting thing here is notice the time gaps here, right? From G to 11N was six years. From N to AC was four plus years with the wave one and wave two. And then Wi-Fi 6 was almost eight years. And now going up to Wi-Fi 7, it's only going to be three years. And as I mentioned before, a lot of times products come out early claiming to be based on the standard that's not yet been finalized. So you can probably expect to see Wi-Fi 7 or products claiming to be Wi-Fi 7 or based on Wi-Fi 7 um, before 2023 is over. So it's a big jump there, um, a very quick jump between those two technologies. So in the industry itself, there's a couple of different players whose names you will see. There is the IEEE. This is the organization that actually creates the technical standard. This is where the 802.3 or 802.11 a, B, et cetera, come from that is referencing their standard that they've created. Um, creating these standards is a slow process. It involves various sorts of engineers, um, people in academia, as well as the manufacturers and sellers themselves. Then there is the Wi-Fi Alliance. So the Wi-Fi Alliance came about, um, at least first as sort of a marketing term or a marketing group to try to uh, 
help sell this technology to end users in the consumer space. And one of the problems that came uh, across in the early days of Wi-Fi is that, um, is that, you know, these standards that the IEEE creates, you know, there's nobody out there enforcing that your product is actually following those IEEE standards. And of course, you know, the way human language works, you know, sometimes things are clear to one person and, and may be interpreted differently by somebody else. So the Wi-Fi Alliance saw an opportunity here to basically clean up the industry and make sure everybody's products work. So they created a number of interoperability tests that you had to go through to be able to use the official Wi-Fi name and the official Wi-Fi logo. Um, since then, things have changed a little bit. Anybody can now use the term Wi-Fi, but in order to have that Wi-Fi logo, um, you do have to go through the Wi-Fi Alliance's interoperability testing still to this day. And you will generally see that on consumer equipment. You generally will not see that on business class products. Um, and just in general, the industry itself has gotten to the point where everybody sort of makes sure their products works with everybody else. Um, it's not like 10, 10 years ago or so um, when the Apple decided to uh, modify the Wi-Fi standards for their iPhones um, to not follow certain aspects of the standard, uh, which required vendors like us and other people making access points and routers to actually have to um, violate the standards in order to uh, make sure that they were compatible with iPhone or iPhone. So that, that's sort of gone away now and everybody sort of works with everybody else. Um, and then there's the FCC. So the FCC is the government agency that regulates radio waves. They determine which frequencies we get to use and they determine what we get to do on those frequencies when we use them. Which takes us over here into my next slide radio waves. So just some background on radio waves. Um, as a general rule, as frequency goes up, you can cram more data into it. Um, but also as frequency goes up, the range goes down. Um, so uh, a good example of this is cordless phones. For those of you that are old like me, for some of you young people out there, you may not have experienced this. Um, but in the early days of cordless phones, there was the 900 gigahertz. They were 900 gigahertz, or excuse me, megahertz was the frequency they were using. Um, and this is what you would use for your, um, your cordless phone. So when someone called your house, it would ring your phone and you could walk around. Um, the good thing with these phones is that they had ridiculous range. If you lived in town, there was a good chance you could walk out your house and walk over to the other side of the street and still maintain a phone conversation. Um, and then 2.4 gigahertz opened up. So 2.4 gigahertz is higher frequency. It's also a wider frequency band. So we can fit more phones on there at once, but we could also cram more data on there. So sound quality went up. So one of the complaints with 900 megahertz phones was the sound quality wasn't that great. Um, so by going up to 2.4 gigahertz, um, you now had much better sound quality. You had less interference from neighbors if you lived in an apartment or condo but the range was less. You could no longer walk across the street and maintain a call. Maybe you could go out on your porch or slightly out into your yard. Um, and that was it. And then later on, um, early 90s, there was a big push to five gigahertz. So again, we were able to cram more data on there. So the sound quality went up, but the range became even less. So now you couldn't use your phone necessarily outside in some bigger houses. You know, there may have been corners of your house where you couldn't get a signal. And you'll notice those frequencies there, 2.4 and 5, those are the same frequencies that we use for Wi-Fi. And this has to do with the FCC rules. So basically, generally, if you are going to be operating a radio transmitter, which a wireless device is, you have to have a license that you uh, buy from the FCC, and those can get quite expensive. So what the FCC has done is they have opened up chunks of spectrum. Um, and say basically anybody can use these chunks of spectrum. There's no license needed. And then they give the manufacturers a set of rules and behaviors for those products that they have to follow. So the three chunks that have traditionally been available have been 900 megahertz, 2.4 gigahertz, then in the 90s, 5 gigahertz. And then in 2022, um, they opened up 6 gigahertz for us. So anything that is using wireless or radio communications has to be operating in one of these channels unless you have purchased a license from the FCC. 
Um, so that means things can get kind of crowded and you have to be flexible um, with your wireless deployments to make sure they play friendly with other wireless devices, which may be operating using the same channels as your device. So, you know, Bluetooth uses 2.4, a lot of uh, RC cars use 2.4, et cetera. So when we talk about, um, you know, Wi-Fi strength, we're generally talking about um, the power that the signal is transmitted. And we use that as sort of a crude way to approximate, you know, range. Is this product's got higher power than that product? It probably has better range. Um, so if you are looking at data sheets for business class products, you will probably see um, power output um, designated as DBM. So for every increase of three dBm, you double the amount of energy that is being transmitted. Whereas um, if you're looking at consumer products, it's very normal to see power output um, listed as milliwatts. And this is generally a more of a marketing thing, right? You know, if you are advertising to your customer, hey, buy my product, it's 23 dBm where my competitor's product is 20 dBm, it doesn't sound like much of a difference. But if you say to them, my product is 200 milliwatts, theirs is only 100 milliwatts, it sounds like a lot more a lot more differentiation than when you're using DBM. Now on the business side of things, the reason we use DBM is because DBM and DBI in the case of antennas is what we use to be able to calculate um, how far a signal can go, the quality of signal, signal to noise ratio, et cetera. So if you're trying to calculate total output power of a system, it's really easy. You can add DBM and then subtract and add DBI for antennas and connectors and cables to come up with your total um, radiated output, um, especially in some of your outdoor systems where um, you're bumping up against FCC limits to maximum power and you need to calculate those. So some terminology you may see used here when it comes to Wi-Fi that's important here. The first one is going to be signal to noise ratio. This is probably the most uh, important um, term that you need to know that's going to affect the quality of your life when it comes to Wi-Fi. And it's something that a lot of people aren't familiar with. And signal to noise ratio is simply um, a measurement of the signal, what you want to hear versus the noise, all the other sounds, or in this case, you know, wireless communications that you don't care about. So the better the signal to noise ratio, the easier it is for you to hear that signal. And the easier it is for you to hear the signal when it comes to technology generally means the faster data rate, the more data rate that can be pumped through. As your signal to noise ratio gets worse, your products will start slowing down to compensate for that. And eventually if there's too much noise, you know, you don't get a connection at all. So a good analogy for this is just like having a conversation one-on-one -on -one with somebody, right? If you are sitting next to each other in an empty conference room or an empty meeting room, talking to each other, you can talk at a certain volume level and have no problem hearing each other. If you go to a bar on Friday night, sit the same distance apart and try to talk to each other at the same volume of speech, you're not going to be able to hear each other because of all the noise of the other patrons and the other activities in the bar, right? So you either need to leave and go outside to have your conversation, or you need to speak louder to increase, which would be in this case, the strength of, or strengthening your signal versus the sound of the noise so you can understand each other. Attenuation has to do with the fact that Wi-Fi signals and radio signals degrade with range. So as the signal travels out, even through empty air, the signal um, will lose some of its power. Um, walls and obstructions are going to degrade the signal or attenuate the signal much more than open air is. But even when it comes to open air, there's, there's different th uh, things that can affect um, what's going on here. Primarily, primary one being um, when it comes to humidity. Right, so if you're in some, you're out in the uh, Arizona desert, it's the middle of August, it's sunny, there is, you know, 10%, 15% humidity, um, and you're creating an outdoor point-to-point Wi-Fi link, you may have a good, strong, stable connection. And then when monsoon season comes in, which brings a bunch of um, dense, moisture-rich air up from um, Mexico, the Baja area into Arizona, the humidity goes up. So now you've got a lot more water um, in the air, and now maybe your wireless link is not no longer fast enough, or maybe it's unable to make that connection at all. So even then, you know, when you're dealing with Wi-Fi, you know, there's weird things like that, such as humidity level, which may affect the performance of your network that you don't actually consider at the time you're doing your deployment. 
So if you want to calculate how far your signal can go, this is the formula up here, right? So this is telling you basically in theory, how far can your connection go? So it is not an easy formula for you to calculate off the top of your head. Um, and as you notice here, these are using logarithmic numbers here, um, which is letting you know that, um, you know, the signal drops off a lot faster than you would necessarily think. It going from using the consumer terms here, a 200 milliwatt radio to a 100 watt radio, or vice versa, going from 100 watts to 200 watts does not double the reach of that signal. It only increases it a little bit uh, because of the fall off um, of the signal as it attenuates going through the air. So here's a list of some common things and some average, you know, sort of uh, signal loss you can expect, right? So just a plain glass window the signal can expect to see about a three dB um, loss, right? So it's it's almost a a uh, halving of the power, right? That's in the room as it goes through the window. Um, and it gives you approximately a thirty percent hit um, to your to your uh, signal range, right? A tinted window, which has one of those metallic filterings on it, metallic reflects radio waves just like it reflects light. Um, it's going to have a much higher uh, level of loss on there, as will metal screen. So if it's at a home and it's trying to go through a window and through a screen, it's going to have a much bigger hit to the effective range than if you're sending that signal through the top half of the window, which doesn't have a screen. And then, of course, as walls get thicker and more dense, the bigger and bigger hit you're going to have as the signal tries to penetrate through it. Another very commonly overlooked aspect of Wi-Fi, which is a huge explainer of a lot of the issues people run into out in the field, is the fact that Wi-Fi is a bi-directional communication. Even when you're doing something like downloading a file off an FTP site, or you are streaming a video from Netflix or YouTube, which seems like it's all down, downhill, right? The server is sending that video file to your computer or your phone or whatever device you're using your device still has to send back acknowledgements to the access point and acknowledgements back to the original server, letting it know that it's received the data, the data was readable, it's ready for you to send the next packet. So again, it's the same thing. It's, it's just like having a conversation with another person. Um, if you both are talking at the same level of loudness, you, you will be able to um, stretch out um, you know, how far you guys can go. If one of you can talk louder than the other, one person's going to be able to hear them, but he's not going to be able to hear the responses. Um, and that's something that's a huge play when it comes to Wi-Fi. Why is that? Um, and that has to do with, there's a huge imbalance, right, in the power of the signal that's coming out of something like a business class access point and somebody's mobile phone, tablet, laptop, et cetera. Right, so in this case here, a, uh, a typical access, business access point is 500 milliwatts or more of power. So it can send that signal a pretty good long distance. However, most of your typical mobile client devices are at 25 milliwatts or less output power. Right, so while your phone may be able to hear the access point as you get in your car and you know, start to drive away from home, your phone isn't able to get the signal back to the access point. So something that's commonly seen here, and we, we, we hear these complaints a lot is, hey, I'm on my phone. My phone shows my Wi-Fi has two bars or three bars of signal, and yet the internet's really slow or it's not working at all. Why is that? And the answer there is just that. Your phone is telling you how strong the signal is that it hears from your access point. It doesn't know how strong the signal is back at the access point that's coming from your mobile device. Um, so your mobile device thinks it's got a good solid connection when in reality, your access point can't hear it and it's causing it to not be able to function. And again, another common one is, you know, when you go to work, um, you jump in your car and you start to drive away. And if you're streaming something or you're trying to look up directions on Google Maps or Waze or something like that, you'll find it doesn't work. And the reason it doesn't work is because your phone hasn't yet switched over to your cellular connection because it can still hear the access point in your house. It just can't get the signal out of your car and down the road back to your house. So that, that's something that um, really has to do with this two-way communication. So that's really important to keep in mind when you're doing site surveys and things like that, that you can actually maintain 
not just see that there's a strong signal there, but make sure you've actually got enough upstream bandwidth at that signal strength to get your signal back um, to your AP. And also why um, a common problem we run into is people will do the site survey with a laptop, which, which is you know a nice business class, you know, $1,500, $1,400 laptop. It's got a good strong Wi-Fi card in it. Um, so that they're out there plotting out, you know, the warehouse coverage or they're plotting out the hotel room coverage where the warehouse guy is using a little PDA type device um, to scan barcodes or where the guest user is probably using a cheap Amazon tablet or Walmart tablet to connect to the Wi-Fi. So it works great for the guy who's doing the site survey with a powerful laptop. But then when the guests actually get there, or the end users actually get there and start trying to use it, they start having issues because the power output of their devices doesn't match what was in the device that was doing the original site survey. Okay, so uh, moving on from that for now, um, RF behavior. So when the signal comes out of your access point or your laptop or whatever it is, in general, the signal radiates out as sort of a circular pattern from the transmitting device. Um, you know, we refer to radio waves all the time and radio waves um, behave very similarly to waves in a pond or another large body of water. Right, you, you throw a rock into the pond and you will see the ripples, the waves radiate out in a circular pattern from where that, that rock hit the water. And that's the same thing when it comes to Wi-Fi in general, is that you know, whatever device is transmitting the signal, it's, those waves are radiating out, basically a circular pattern. And in many ways, they behave just like those water waves do when they uh, hit obstructions um, in that pond. Right, so I'm sure we've all seen this if you're looking at a man-made pond where there are walls or something where there's a dock coming out, right? The waves come in, they hit the hard surface, then you see smaller, weaker waves bouncing off of that surface. It's the same sort of thing that can happen with Wi-Fi waves. When those Wi-Fi waves hit a, hit a surface, um, they then scatter out into, can scatter out into multiple smaller waves with different strengths in different directions. Um, Something that they can do is they can hit a solid object that they can't pass through, and they can actually do this weird thing where the waves wrap around. So you can have a situation where you've got a wave coming in at a direction like this. The wave direction is here, and then when it hits it, it can actually sort of wrap around and radiate out to the other side. And then unlike water, when it comes to radio waves, radio waves can pass through solid objects, provided they're not too dense. So they will pass through, but they will lose a lot of their strength. And in an environment, right, where like an office building or your home, where there's all sorts of objects in the walls and on the floors, your desks, your furniture, all those things, right, you can get some very complex behaviors as the signals bounce around um, and experience different effects based on where in the room or which objects they've had to bounce off of or pass through. Um, so that's one of the wise areas where, you know, it can be sometimes hard to troubleshoot some of these Wi-Fi issues is because there can be some very complex behavior. And unfortunately, you know, radio waves are invisible. You can't see this going on. All right. So this is now going on from there, We're talking about how Wi-Fi itself behaves. Now, you remember, Wi-Fi itself was originally created back in 1997. There weren't a lot of users or devices that would you would expect to be wireless operating on a network at a time, right? I mean, just, just go back a few years, you know, I'll just use my house. I'm, I'm obviously a little bit of a, you know, somebody's a little bit more into tech than your average person, but, but still, I think the idea is largely the same, you know. 10 years ago in my house, what did I have? I had my laptop and I, I had an iPad. Um, and maybe a Wi-Fi phone or two. So I had a few wireless devices in my house. Now we look at my house today, what do I have? Well, I still have that. But I also have two fire sticks, which are Wi-Fi. I have a smart TV, which has Wi-Fi. I've got 20 some smart plugs and lights and things like that, all using the Wi-Fi. So we've got a lot more wireless devices on the network than we did just 10 years ago, let alone back in 1997. And of course, back then you were looking primarily as using it to transmit small amounts of data, data from devices on your network. Whereas today, right, you're doing a lot of streaming. There's a lot more bandwidth being consumed than just a few years ago. Um, you know, most people are now streaming HD, HDR content where, you know, if you were streaming 10 years ago, it was probably SD content that was really heavily compressed. So we're using a lot more devices on the network than we used to. 
and the applications are using a lot more bandwidth and are a lot more demanding. And this causes problems for us because back when they designed this back in 1997, this is basically how they decided how to transmit data. Now, one thing I, I failed to mention earlier was when it comes to radio signals, as a general rule, only one device can transmit at the same time. If two or more devices transmit at the same time, it causes interference and, and loss of that data, needing it to be retransmitted. Um, you know, it goes back to if you've ever used analog walkie-talkies and two people tried to talk at the same time on different walkie-talkies, that third walkie-talkie would just get a bunch of of, of garbled noise as both signals fought with each other um, to come through. And it's the same thing with Wi-Fi. So with Wi-Fi, each device takes a turn transmitting data. And this is what they came up with back in 1997. Basically, if you've got data to send, you sense the medium. And sense the medium basically means you listen. Is anybody else currently transmitting anything? Yes or no. So if no one is transmitting anything, you send your data packets. If someone else is already transmitting something, there's a random number generator that determines how much time to wait. You will wait that time and then you start the process over again. Um, a fun way to think of this um, would be similar to having a conference call. Uh, back in the good old days before VoIP, you would call into these conference call services, and it was pretty easy to figure out when somebody had paused and when it was your turn to talk. But occasionally, right, you'd wait till some, you know, the person talking paused, and then you would jump in with your thoughts. But if somebody else there also has some thoughts and we're waiting for a chance to talk, you would both talk over each other. So that's the same sort of thing here. Of course, VoIP made that even worse because it adds latency and delay. Um, and that sort of ties into what's going on here a little bit more as we go through this. But as you can see, it's not a very efficient system for deciding who gets to transmit when. And it's possible, very possible, for multiple devices to decide to transmit at the same time um, because they're both using basically just listening and then transmitting. So we also have this thing here related to this called the hidden node problem. Right, so we're relying on these devices to listen to see if anyone's using the current channel that they're using before transmitting data. But what you end up with in a Wi-Fi scenario is you've got your main access point here that's covering a large area and you've got multiple client devices. These client devices, in this case here, we've got two laptops. They're both within range of the access point, but they are not within range of each other. So if this access point is transmitting data, and this device wants to transmit data, it will listen. And because of where it is, it cannot hear that this laptop over on the right is currently transmitting. So it thinks that the medium is idle and it's okay for it to transmit. So it will start transmitting. And then the access point is going to be hearing both signals at the same time. And it's going to be unable to determine what to do with those signals. So you get a bunch of drop packets. So in the mod, you know, in the old days, it wasn't that big of an issue. But these days, right, we've got a lot more devices on that network, and they're sending a lot more data than they used to. So they need more time to transmit. So as you add those devices onto the network, you increase the chances of this happening. So this leads us to a very common problem we run into out there, right? People say, well, how many devices, how many users can I have on this access point? And we'll talk more in depth about some of the other issues that can come up to this, but this is one of the things that happens. And that is, um, is it's really hard to say because it really depends what those client devices are doing. I can point you to the data sheet where it says, you know, this AP supports 256 clients or 512 clients, but that's just a reference basically to how much memory has been allocated. Um, Give me just a second. Let me let me turn off Skype so these messages aren't constantly popping up. Yes, no, no, yes. It will not let me close Skype. Lovely. Oh well. Um, let me do it with the task manager real quick. Apologies for this. Skype is normally not that active. Okay. 
So where were we? we were talking about here as you had more devices. So it really depends what those devices are doing. So you're going to run up to problems with Wi-Fi itself in general, long before you start running into issues with what the data sheet says, right? The data sheet says you can have 512 on there. It's got enough memory in there to store all of the associated contact information for 512 devices. But generally, they're going to be stepping on each other's toes long before you get anywhere close to 512 or 256. And it has nothing to do with your access point which vendor's access point you have. It has to do with the wireless users and the limited amount of time um, that's available for each of them to be able to send data. So in general, as you add users to your access point, your aggregated throughput goes down. And again, we'll talk a little bit more about that um, in some slides coming up, but it is related to this, at least in part. So the next thing I wanna talk about is data rate versus throughput. Um, and these are terms that can be used many different ways. So I've sort of defined them on there. So the data rate is what you're going to see on data sheets and marketing materials for access points. That's where you see AC3600, AC AX1800, et cetera. That is the maximum data rate that that device supports. Um, and it includes both the data you want to send, right? If you're downloading a file from the internet, it includes all of that data, but it also includes all of the extra data that goes into making Wi-Fi possible, right? We're in this shared space where there's all sorts of different devices, many of them not even Wi-Fi that may be using those same radio frequencies. There's interference, there's noise, there's all this other weird stuff going on. So because of that, Wi-Fi has a lot of extra protocol overhead, which is extra data, checksums and things like that, which have to be tacked on top of the data that you want to download or you want to send in order to make it work. So there's the data you're trying to download off a server, and then there's all the extra data that's being added on top of that between your client device and your access point or router to make Wi-Fi possible. And so because of that throughput, which I, I'm defining here as the, the type of data speeds you would see if you do a speed test, is generally about half of the speed you see on the data sheet. And you can pull up any vendor's Wi-Fi product on Amazon and look at the negative reviews and you will see a lot of negative reviews claiming that, you know, complaining about this. This product says it supports, you know, three gigabit wireless, but I'm only able to get 1.2 or I'm only gonna be, I'm only getting 1.4. And a big part of that is going to be the protocol throughput, right? So, or the, the protocol overhead, is not being counted when you're running speedtest.net or you're running some other speed testing software. It's only calculating the data that it's trying to download and send. It is ignoring that protocol overhead. Um, so the question might be, why do we do it this way? And the reason we do it this way, the reason why you know the data sheet uses this data rate is because using this data rate also could be referred to as a physical rate or a link rate is what we've used for networking products forever. Um, and it made a lot of sense back in the day, right? With ethernet, there's almost no overhead um, in the ethernet space. And same goes for some of the other uh, wired um, networking protocols over the years. So, you know, using this data rate was gonna always give you a number that was very similar to this throughput because there wasn't a lot of extra overhead. It wasn't until we got into the space of stuff like Wi-Fi and Powerline, where we're in an environment that's very, very uh, difficult to work in, um, that you started to see these big discrepancies between the data rate and the throughput. But the networking industry has always used data rate um, to keep things simple. So, you know, it's just been a case of inertia, and that's what we've always done sort of thing. Um, you know, some vendors in the early days of Wi-Fi tried to get around from that and tried to advertise the actual, you know, throughput a user would see trying to transfer a file. But, you know, most users aren't technically aware, you know, the same thing that causes people to complain about the differences between data rate and throughput also means that those same people aren't gonna know the differences when they're looking at boxes. So if one vendor is claiming data rate and one vendor is claiming throughput, which is about half of the data rate, you know, they're more likely to buy the data rate products. Everyone's just stuck with using data rate for everything. But that is something to keep in mind. And of course, there's all sorts of other things which could be degrading the performance, right? Maybe their client device doesn't support the faster speeds. Maybe they're too far away from their, their router. Maybe their internet connection is actually slower than their 
Wi-Fi connection, and they're using uh, Ookla or speedtest.net, um, and that's that's actually what's restricting the speeds of their data transmissions, et cetera. But in general, you see a lot of this, and you'll see a lot of people complaining that they're only getting somewhere around half the speed um, at home versus what they see advertised, and that's why. It's because you're measuring two different things here. So now we're going to talk about how does Wi-Fi increase the speed? And this is not what you would do. This is what, as a uh, IEEE engineer, as a manufacturer like us, this is how we get the faster speeds when it comes to Wi-Fi. So the first way of doing it would be increasing the encoding. Um, so it's something called QAM. It's basically 64-bit QAM, 256-bit QAM, 1024 QAM. It's basically how much data can you cram onto those radio waves. And as chipsets have become more powerful while also re using less uh, actual electrical energy to be able to do that, we've been able to increase the encoding QAM to cram more data into the same space, right? As you, as you cram more on there, you need uh, much more powerful CPUs to be able to um, compress the data and then uncompress the data as it comes off of the radio waves. The other way is increasing spatial streams. And the other way is increasing bandwidth. And bandwidth is the easiest one to understand. 802.11G, a Wi-Fi channel was 20 megahertz in size. So that's how much radio wave bandwidth was being used. With 11N, we got the ability to use 40 megahertz channels, right? So we were able just by that to claim double the speed by going from 20 to 40. You've doubled the amount of uh, airtime or radio waves that you can use. So you've doubled the amount of data you can put in there. And then with 11AC, we jumped up to 80 megahertz in wave one and then 160 megahertz in wave two and Wi-Fi six. So now we'll talk a little bit more about some of these in a little bit more detail. So the next thing you need to understand is, you know, just how much bandwidth is available for us to use. So if you go into a router or an access point and you look at your 2.4 gigahertz channels here in North America, you will see that there are 11 channels to choose from. Unfortunately, those channels are not spaced very far apart. Um, the original, you know, defining of those channels predates Wi-Fi and has to do with other wireless devices using 2.4. Um, so because of that, when you look at that, you think, oh, wow, I've got a lot of space to choose from. But actually, those channels, again, are around 20 megahertz in width. And this total 2.4 space is only around 60 megahertz in size. So realistically, in North America, we've only got three channels we can use that don't cause interference with any of the others. So as soon as you have a fourth access point in the area, such as, uh, you know, in an office or in a condo or apartment, you know, where you're all within range of each other. Um, as soon as you add that fourth one, you're going to be overlapping with one or more of your neighbors, and you're going to start having interference issues, this co-channel interference, uh, multiple devices sharing that same channel um, and fighting to be able to use it. So I mentioned before, you know, one of the ways we got faster speeds from 11G to 11N was we doubled the bandwidth to being able to use 40 megahertz channels. Of course, the problem we run into with this is that the 2.4 gigahertz space only has 60 available. So if you're trying to use 40 megahertz channels to get your faster speed, um, that means that you can't have a second access point or router within range of your first one, or else they're going to interfere with each other and degrade the signal performance. Um, so for that reason, most of the products um, that use 40, when you set them to 40 megahertz channel, most of them will automatically drop down to 20 megahertz um, if they see any sort of, any neighbors using that one of those overlapping channels. And again, this is another reason why people may see a difference between the claimed range on their or speed on the data sheet versus what they see with the throughput test is, you know, they may not be able to use that 40 megahertz channel. So that right there is going to have their throughput, um, not even taking into account the protocol overhead issues. And this is a big reason why with 11N, we first started seeing the push to using five gigahertz. Um, we had some poor souls that launched products that were only five gigahertz, um, but the, the industry pretty much by the end of the 11 AC or 11N era uh, had really moved to this idea of using dual radios simultaneously, one on 2.4 for uh, backwards compatibility and for range and one on five gigahertz um, 
for lack of inter for dealing with interference issues. So you can see here when it comes to five gigahertz, if you're using 20 megahertz channels, you've got somewhere in the neighborhood of, uh, of what is it like? I think it's 26 non overlapping channels, right? So we went from three non overlapping channels to 26 non overlapping channels. But you'll notice there's a big section here in the middle, which is highlighted sort of an orangey yellow color. These are called DFS channels. And we need to talk about them for a little bit here, because this is really important when it comes to five gigahertz and some of the issues you see out there in real world deployments. So five gigahertz has not always been on something that everybody got to use. This used to be licensed spectrum where in order to use it, um, you had to have a license. Now, one of the primary users in this space has been radar. Um, weather radar, airport radar, et cetera. And there's some other uses like that. So when the FCC said, hey, we really need to open up more spectrum for home users to use, 2.4 just isn't big enough anymore. Um, they ended up unlocking this five gigahertz spectrum, but you had all these existing users that were already using this space. So the FCC came out with rules that dictate how you can use these five gigahertz channels. So the important one here is before a five gigahertz device using one of these DFS channels can start broadcasting, it has to verify that there are no legacy users using that channel. If there are legacy users using that channel, you don't get to send any data. You have to wait for them to go away for a certain period of time. And same thing, if you're already using that channel and then you detect that there is interference from a legacy user, um, you have to stop using that channel and stop transmitting data. And there can be sign, you know, sources of interference out there, especially in industrial buildings, which your access point may mistake as being legacy user and stop broadcasting. So that causes some issues for us, right? Where um, your users may suddenly get kicked off the network because your access point had to stop broadcasting because it saw or thought it saw a legacy user device using that same channel. Um, and then your AP can change channels, um, but there's gonna be a disconnection, there's gonna be time. So that can obviously cause issues if you're in the middle of a phone call and things like that. And if you're switching from one DFS channel to another DFS channel, again, you've got to wait before you can start broadcasting on that new channel and verify that it's not also in use. So sometimes it can be uh, a reasonably long delay um, when switching channels due to this uh, legacy device issue. The other problem that comes out with this is that getting this DFS certification for your product can add six months to the certification process. So in the consumer space in particular, where people are rushing to be the first to market with the latest, greatest new technology, and if you're too late behind your competitors, you've already lost the market share and you're out of luck, um, a lot of consumer products choose not to go after this DFS certification. Now, some good vendors will provide a firmware or software update that will let you add DFS support at some future date. Not all manufacturers do. In fact, I would say most consumer products don't, but even if they do, what's the chance that grandma knows to go out and download a new firmware and flash it to her, her the chipset on her uh, laptop's Wi-Fi device? So if you're doing bring your own device at the office, this is an area where you're going to run into some issues, um, right? Because you may have users that, that can't get a connection. We do get these calls in our tech support all the time. Hey, we've got this office, we've deployed the office and in the conference room, Bob and Kirk can't get onto the network. Everyone else can, but Bob and Kirk can't. There's something wrong with your access points, fix it. And we look into it and find out, hey, you're using DFS channels. Did you verify that Bob and Kirk's you know, laptop can support DFS? No, we didn't. You look, yep, sure enough, that's the problem. So because of these reasons, a lot of people will choose not to deploy in this DFS space. Another issue you run into here is certain Apple devices don't like some of these channels, even though in theory they do support DFS. They may not, I, I forget which channels they are specifically, but there are some channels here um, which they don't support. Sort of a variation of that consumer thing. Um, so because of that, right, a lot of people choose not to use some of this five gigahertz space. So now you've gone from 26 not overlapping 20 megahertz channels to nine. 
right? So it's a big difference. But again, we're talking about speed. That's how we got here, right? We're talking about speed. We're talking about increasing the, the, the bandwidth that we're using to get faster speed. So we want to double those speeds by using 40 megahertz channels. Well, now you've got just four available that don't overlap with each other if you're avoiding these DFS channels, which you may or may not want to do. Um, a lot of, I would say more people avoid them than use them, or at least some of them. Um, so now again, it, that sounds great in a typical office. However, you know, if you're in an office building, condo or uh, apartments, you know, you, you may be within range of a lot of neighbors, so you're gonna get interference with them. But again, we want faster speeds. How do we get these faster speeds? We're gonna use 80 megahertz channels, right? We've doubled it again. So we doubled the speed from 20 to 40. We've doubled it again. Look how fast our product is. But again, if you're gonna be using these, now you're down to just two non-overlapping channels. And even in uh, a, a small office, you're probably gonna have three or more access points. And now one of them is gonna be interfering with one of the others if you're using these 80 megahertz channels. And then if we jump up to 160 megahertz channels, you have to use DFS. There's no contiguous um, 160 megahertz channels available that don't overlap with DFS. So if you're using those, some of your users may not be able to connect if their device doesn't support these DFS channels. Um, so we got a question here from Andrew. Andrew is asking, do 5G phones use five gigahertz band as well? So no. 5G phones, the 5G is referring not to the bandwidth or the, the chunk of spectrum they're using. 5G refers to uh, fifth generation. So the G there is for generation. So it's fifth generation of cell phone technology. Um, cell phone technologies do not use 2.4, 5, or 6, but they may use um, bordering channels. So for instance, um, they may be using 2.5, and generally, that's not going to cause interference with 2.4 out in the real world, with one exception here. If you're in a larger office building where they are using a DAS system, because the cellular signal does not penetrate into the building, so they, they use this thing called a DAS, which takes the signal from outside for your cellular providers and rebroadcasts it inside the building. Well, if you're using one of those and it's a 2.5 uh, it's using 2.5 gigahertz, for instance, it may cause interference with you, your Wi-Fi network on 2.4. And there are some other, you know, bordering channels. Um, when it comes to cellular technology, whether it's LTE or, or 5G, depends a lot on where you are physically located and which carrier you're on, which, uh, which channels they are using. Um, with 5G, they could be using 2.5. They could be using... Um, I want to say it's 790, I think is another one that you can use. So 790 megahertz, they could be using 2.5 gigahertz, um, or they could be using 60 gigahertz. That's the uh, outdoor um, super high speed, right? So that's the one when they're advertising 5G, that's the one they're always talking about. Um, that super fast 5G speeds, those are based on using 60 gigahertz, right? So 5G or LTE can be using chunks of spectrum all over the, the map. Um, and it, it's it's really hard to know um, which you are currently using, which bands you're using. It just depends which carrier you're on and which bands you are using in that particular geographic area. But they won't be directly overlapping with your Wi-Fi bands. Hope that helps. Um, Kevin's asking here, what's the you know, most ideal setup for high density areas with multiple APs? Um, I will get to that. Um, when we get to the end here, um, once we get through this sort of background and just sort of the understanding of how the technology itself works, um, we will talk a little bit more about, you know, what best practices when it comes to different deployment scenarios. And if I don't answer your question good enough, then go ahead, send the question in again, and I'll answer it there. I'm just clearing up some of these uh, thank yous and things like that. Um, okay, we'll continue on here. So this was one way we increased speed was by increasing the amount of bandwidth that we were using, but there are trade-offs. You get faster speeds, um, but you, you, you increase the chances of getting interference from your neighboring devices. The other one is spatial streams. So this is gonna come back to that scenario I gave you before, which was radio waves sort of act like waves in a water, in a pond. Um, so when you send out your signal, the signal radiates out. And as it radiates out, it hits objects in your, in your office. So in the days of uh, 802.11, A, B, G, and N, 
This was something we called multipath, and it was the bane of our existence. It caused so many issues because what happens is, is the signal is bouncing off of different objects and taking different paths and creating multiple, basically, copies, basically echoes, right? These are echoes. The, the waves go out. And so they're taking, they're bouncing off of things. And so obviously, if you're going out this way and you bounce off of this, you're traveling a further distance than if you're just making a direct straight path from your broadcasting device to your receiving device. So the signal ends up getting there slightly delayed. And you get what's essentially are, are echoes, uh, echo effects. Um, you know, it's, it's no different than being in a, in a, you know, an empty room that doesn't have any uh, acoustic tiles or carpeting and shouting and hearing all your echoes come back. So it can, it could get confusing. So luckily, towards the end of 11N era, some smart people figured out, hey, wait a minute, this isn't a problem. This is something that we can actually use to make Wi-Fi better. And so what they're doing here is they're taking advantage of our wireless devices ability to be able to hear these different echoes. And knowing that um, if we have multiple antennas in our devices, they're spaced out differently, the signals are going to follow slightly different paths um, and using it to send different data on different antennas. So these are our spatial streams. So it's basically, you know, this antenna is going to bounce off of this object to get there. This antenna is going to send data out. It's going to bounce off these objects to get here. They're going to come in as slightly different echoes of each other. And our computer chips are smart enough to listen to those echoes and split them apart and combine them back together again. So what happens is, um, you know, the maximum transmit rate for 11N is that right, 11N? Yeah, I think so, um, is 150 megabits per second. So if we add a second spatial stream, a second antenna, and send, we can send a different 150 megabits per second than this first one, they'll, they'll bounce off objects and they'll come back and re receive your client here, and it's able to then combine them together into one 300 megabits connection. So it's kind of cool. So that's how we're getting some of the faster speeds now as we've increased the number of spatial streams that devices in theory can support. Um, the most common one you see these days is two by two and probably this, there are two spatial streams. The next most common you will see on an access point level is probably four spatial streams. Um, in theory, some of the newer technologies can support eight or more spatial streams. Um, and it does require a different antenna on each end of things. So this is what we call um, MIMO, multiple in, multiple out. So that's, that's how MIMO first started to be used. With 11AC Wave 2, we added something called MUMIMO, multiple user MIMO. And with this, it's the same idea. You can have different data on these different streams. But now, instead of combining those together for one 300 megabit stream at the client device, you can split those streams up and intend them for different client devices. So you've got a 150 megabit stream going to one device and a different 150 megabit stream of data going to a second device. So with 11AC, MIMO only works from the access point to the clients. When the clients need to respond back to the access point, they still have to take turns using the available bandwidth there. So when you're looking on data sheets of business class products, you normally won't see this on your consumer products. You will often see it telling you how many spatial streams you have. Um, and that's important. And you will usually see it like this, a two by two, three by three, four by four, et cetera. So the first number here is how many antennas are transmitting or how many spatial streams you can send at once. The second number is how many spatial streams your device can receive. So when we're looking at routers and access points, it's always always going to be the same. You can transmit to, then you can receive to. If you can transmit for, you can receive for. However, on client devices, this starts to become different. Um, on client devices where we're trying to, you know, we've got minimum amount of space for antennas, we're dealing with lower power devices, we're trying to, you know, save the battery and make it last as long as possible it's very often to see one by two, two by three. So again, that first number is transmit, the second number is received. So basically your client device oftentimes can receive a much faster uh, data connection than it can, then, or can, you know, can receive data much faster than it can then send data back out. 
So that's what those means. Now there is another one that you may see out there. Um, if you're a Cisco guy in particular, um, they're the ones I think that do it the most often. And you will see the normal two by two, three by three, four by four. Then you're gonna see a colon and another number. And in that situation, what you're seeing here is not four by four spatial streams. You're seeing you've got four potential spatial streams. And then the and then this third number here after the colon is actually how many of those you can actually use. So I've got four antennas that can transmit, four antennas that can receive, but my chipset can actually only use three of them. So the reason they do this is um, Cisco, for instance, doesn't use smart antenna technology. This is kind of their way to sort of uh, increase receive sensitivity um, without having to pay the extra money for smart antenna or other related technologies. Um, I cannot tell you how well it works. Um, if it's really, so in general though, you're gonna treat this like a three by three. If you see four by four colon three, it's, it's really three spatial streams. So it's really a three by three in practical terms. It's just in theory got the flexibility to choose the three best antennas to use. Um, and I don't know really realistically how well, you know, a uh, device can decide which of the four antennas is the best, which of the three of the four antennas are the best to use. So those are spatial streams. So now we put it all together. So if you want to find out how fast your access point is, you look at your technology and, and then you, uh, to know what the maximum speeds are. And then you look at, um, you know, what modulate, how many spatial streams are you using? How many, what modulation type are you using and how wide of a channel are you using? So when you're looking at a device, it's always going to claim best case scenario, maximum number of spatial streams the device supports, the maximum encoding the device supports and the maximum channel bandwidth the, the device supports. So we'll just use this here. We've got one spatial stream, we're using 256 bit QAM and we're using 160 megahertz channels. So that this device would advertise itself as supporting 900 megabits, right? This 866.7 is going to get rounded up to 900 for the data sheet. But realistically, maybe you've got devices that don't support DFS. So you're only going to add, you're only going to enable 80 megahertz channel usage. So right then you've dropped your speed in half from 866 to 433. And again, these are data rates, not throughput. And unfortunately, you've got some RF interference in your environment. 256 qualm can't be used because it's just too noisy. Your signal to noise ratio isn't good enough. So maybe it drops to 64 qualm and now your maximum data rate is dropped from 433 to 325. So you can see here the maximum speeds that are advertised is gonna be best case scenario. But in the real world, there's a lot of things just with this that are gonna prevent you from necessarily being able to use that maximum speed. And that's before we start dealing with client issues. So as I talked about before, there's really no good or easy answer for how many devices can I get on one AP. I will say in general, it doesn't matter which manufacturer you're looking at. It doesn't matter if you're looking at a cheap little uh, $59 TP-Link access point or a you know, $1,500 Cisco. Um, generally, the choke point is going to be the protocol itself, not the number you see on the, the data sheet. Um, and if they're both using 11N and they're both using the same number of spatial streams, you're gonna run into the same issue regardless, or the same cap realistic terms, um, regardless of which vendor's product you're using. Um, and it just has to do with, you know, the types of devices that are connected, the applications that are being used, um, things like that. It, it's really hard to say. Um, we generally try to give when people ask, we try to find out, you know, what your application is. And then we, we've got some general rules of thumb that we've learned over time. But as a ge general broad rule, you generally don't want to have more than 50 devices per access point. Um, and if those devices are really are active and you're actually using those devices, it may be significantly less than that. Here's an example here showing um, a real world example or a real world simulation here. So we've got an access point. The client devices are all identical, not only in what the support chipset wise and feature wise, but identical signal strength, um, et cetera. So what we have here is we have users here 
and they are streaming a three megabit per second video stream, we'll say. If we've got a laptop here, the access point supports three spatial streams, and this client, these client devices also support three spatial streams. So what you see here is oh, this access point is going to allow us to have 34 users simultaneously streaming this three megabit connection without issues. It gets us an aggregated throughput of 100 megabits per second and use, utilizing about 77% of the available airtime. So if we change these laptops out for a tablet, which only supports two spatial streams, everything else is exactly the same. The only thing that is changing is the number of spatial streams that our client devices can support. We now can only fit 21 of devices on the network streaming that video before we start running into issues because we aren't able to use all the available bandwidth because we only can support two spatial streams. So now we've got an aggregated throughput of just 65 megabits per second and airtime utilization is down to about 75. If we go even further and say, yeah, we're taking out those tablets and we're putting in cheap Android phones or maybe cheap tablets that only support one spatial stream. Now we can only fit 10 devices on that same access point. And our aggregated throughput's just 30 megabits per second. And you know, in the real world, right, we've got a huge mix of devices coming onto our wireless net networks. We don't know which ones, you know, support which spatial streams. There may be other things degrading their performance. Maybe in an environment where some users are using 802.11b, some are using G, some are using N. All of these things make it really difficult to calculate realistically how many devices can get on the network. But you see here in this scenario, just by changing that one variable, how many spatial streams the client device supports, we go from 34 devices can use this access point down to just 10. So now I'm going to talk a little bit more about co-channel interference. Um, I've already mentioned it a number of times here, but we'll, we'll go a little bit more in depth because it's leading up to our smart antenna technology. Um, so now we're going to start talking about some of the technologies you're going to see on our access points um, and some of our competitors. It's not just a Zycel thing. Um, so co-channel interference, as I mentioned before, in general, only one device is able to transmit at a time and they have to take turns transmitting um, on a same channel. And we've got a limited number of channels that are available. And as we talked about before, those access points tend to be powerful. Those signals can go a really long way. So anytime you've got a device that's hearing signals coming from two or more devices on that same channel, you will have this co-channel interference where packets will be dropped and data needs to be reset. So the traditional way you deal with co-channel interference is you do a site survey and you spend a ridiculous amount of time trying to figure out which APs should be on which channels to minimize interference with other APs. That is largely now the automated process done by your wireless LAN controller or cloud controller. The other way you did it here is you did it by dropping your power, right? So here's the AP is located here in the middle, and this is the signal that's radiating out. So what you would do here is you would drop your signal strength so you, you don't broadcast at full output power. And that then reduces the amount of interference and the amount of overlap. Um, it absolutely works good, but obviously now you've got a lower coverage area. So you may have some gaps that you need to add additional access points into. It also is going to affect your signal to noise ratio, right? So as their signal strength goes down, it's going to have a worse signal to noise ratio versus that the ratio of that noise out there. So you may end up getting performance issues from that. Um, So smart antenna is one of the technologies that's been designed to solve this. In general, smart antenna, you're going to find it on our products and you're going to find it on Ruckus products. Um, our implementation is a little bit different than theirs, um, but it's generally the same idea. So generally in an access point, you've got a fixed coverage pattern. Your, your access points traditionally are designed to be mounted on a ceiling above the area to be covered. And their antennas are optimized based on that scenario for, to provide coverage below them in a sort of a circular pattern. You do get for outdoor stuff, you get directional antennas, which focus the antenna in a certain direction. So smart antenna, instead of having that one fixed antenna pattern, smart antenna 
has the ability to choose from hundreds of different antenna patterns, and it can use different antenna patterns for each client. And our algorithm will take a look at where the client is in relation to the access point, and we'll try to focus the signal towards that client device. In addition, our smart antenna technology also looks for other sources of interference. In this case here, we're using a microwave as the example, um, but it can be you know, another access point. It can be some industrial equipment like an, an AC that's putting out RF interference, et cetera. So we will take that in mind and try to choose an antenna pattern that also ignores the sources of noise, lowering how strong that interfering signal may be. So there's an example here. And one of the things here with smart antenna is it doesn't require anything special on the client device. This is purely an access point based technology. And unlike beamforming, it works just fine with clients as they are mobile and move around. It will constantly be able to update the antenna pattern for that mobile device. So we've got some examples here. This is a hotel scenario. These are using the uh, wall plate APs, which are designed to have one, one access point per room. And us and Ubiquity have basically the same product. The only difference here is our product has smart antennas and theirs doesn't. They're both the same wireless technology, same spatial streams, roughly the same output power. The only real difference is that smart antenna technology. So we're using five gigahertz channels here to avoid interference. And we've got this, we're on two different floors and we've got the AP staggered out. We're using these non DFS channels because these are consumer devices and the DFS users may not be able to connect. So we turn on one access point using whatever channel I think we're using in this channel 100. So we've got turn on just one AP in, in the hotel here. And we do an aggregated throughput. We've got multiple clients. We connect and we see how much data can the combined push through the access point. And you see it's roughly the same. Both of us are pushing out just over 400 megabits per second. Ubiquity in this, this test beat us by two megabits per second. Um, and the airtime utilization was 67%. In theory, in theory you've got a maximum of 100% channel utilization, but you almost never get close to that um, because of interference issues and just the way the protocols work. So now we same scenario, we've added a second AP. It's a couple rooms away um, on that same channel. And then we do the speed tests again using um, clients connected to both access points. And you'll notice here, our aggregated throughput was 785 megabits per second, whereas Ubiquity um, is only at 555 megabits per second. And that's because of the smart antenna is able to ignore a lot of that interference between these two APs. Um, and it allows us to achieve 131% channel efficiency. We are able to use more airtime than is in theory available to us because we're able to have devices on both of these APs transmitting at the same time without them interfering with each other or reducing the amount of interference that happens between the two. Another thing you will notice here is the speeds between both of the Zycel smart antenna APs are roughly the same, 385 versus 404, where you notice over here with Ubiquity, there's a big mismatch here. It's almost, this AP is getting almost twice the throughput of this AP, and it just has to do with them fighting for the available airtime. And you see here, they get up to 95% um, utilization, which is about as good as you can get without smart antenna. So now we do the same thing with the third AP and we see the same sort of situation playing out. We've now increased our aggregated throughput to 900 megabits per second, and we've jumped up to 155% of the available airtime, um, where you notice here with Ubiquity, they've pretty much topped out and are pretty much the same aggregated throughput as before. And again, it's really lopsided between which AP gets how much throughput as, the, as their users and the APs fight for that airtime against each other. So it's not to pick on Ubiquity. The difference here really is smart antenna. And I would expect to see similar differences if you compared, for instance, a Ruckus um, to a Ubiquity, or you compared a Zycel smart antenna to a Cisco non-smart antenna, et cetera. Um, we chose these because the specs were so close to each other other than the smart antenna technology. So we'll start talking now about just some general rules. So again, um, your typical access point, 
has a single antenna pattern that's optimized for the idea that it's going to be mounted on the ceiling above the area to be covered. Now, unfortunately, out there in the real world, okay, you don't get to always mount your access points on the ceiling directly overhead. Unfortunately, sometimes you have to settle for mounting them on the wall. So that causes some issues because the antenna pattern isn't designed for wall mount. So the signal's not going to carry out far enough horizontally as you would want. And a lot of that signal is going to go up into the ceiling or down into the floor. If you're in a multiple floor building, it may cause interference between the floors. So generally what you're going to want to do though is um, you're going to want to mount that antenna, or excuse me, the access point centrally in the area to be covered and you want to mount it within reason as high as you can. And the reason you want to mount it up really, really high is you want to have the shortest direct connection between your clients and the access point. You don't want the signal to have to pass through people, walls, cubicles, computers, et cetera, because those are all going to significantly degrade the performance through attenuation, as well as just uh, creating a lot of multipath issues. So the higher, the better within reason. So as many people as possible have clear line of sight between the client device and the access point as you possibly can. Obviously, if you're in a giant you know, stadium or something like that, the roof or the ceiling may be higher up than would be ideal. But in general, you know, as high as you, you possibly can. Most of our office deployments, right, you've got the office space here, you've got the true ceiling up here, and then you've got a acoustic drop ceiling that drops below down here. So generally, you would mount the uh, access point on the drop ceiling itself. Um, However, we do run into issues where, you know, we've had our, our installers say, hey, you know, this customer doesn't want me to poke holes in their drop ceiling. They don't want the access to point to be visible, et cetera. And as a general rule, it's perfectly okay, as long as building codes allow it, um, to rest the access point face down on top of the drop ceiling. Most of your typical acoustic drop ceiling material is just basically ground up fiber. Um, it doesn't degrade the signal that much. So if your customer won't let you or you don't want to have to be poking holes in their acoustic tiles, in general, you can just set the access points on top of those drop ceilings, again, provided that it is um, allowed by code. You generally don't want to mount the access point on the actual real ceiling. And the reason for that is generally this real ceiling area here has a bunch of uh, ductwork, conduit, pipes, things like that, things that are metal, things that are dense metal products. And Wi-Fi doesn't like dense metal products. It blocks the signal or reflects the signal and can cause issues. So you generally want to be below any sort of metal stuff on the actual real ceiling, um, which is why drop ceilings tend to be ideal. Um, in situations where there is no drop ceiling, you will often use a uh, extender pipe. Uh, or mounting bracket that basically the mounting bracket sticks to the real ceiling and it drops down, you know, so many inches so that the access point is located below all of that other metal stuff that may be attached to the ceiling. Um, when it comes to hotels, the traditional way that hotels have been done is this what we call antenna coverage. Um, and that is you take the access point, you mount it in a hallway, between the rooms and it can provide coverage for anywhere from four to eight um, rooms. In the old days, sometimes we'd see up to 16 rooms where it would cover eight rooms on one floor and eight rooms on the other floor. And as a general rule, that has gone away. Uh, most of your mid-tier and higher hotels, you know, we still get these uh, small franchise hotelers with, you know, really cheap, uh, motels that are, you know, want as few APs as possible that still do this umbrella coverage. But in general, the industry has moved away from it. And the reason for that is because what Wi-Fi users are doing has moved away from that. Um, you know, it used to be, again, 10 years ago or more, you know, most people didn't have a Wi-Fi device. It was just your business users and your business users were using that Wi-Fi device to download and send emails, which don't use a lot of bandwidth. So one AP for eight rooms or more was fine. You know, now you, you've got people wanting to stream video in their room. 
Um, and you've got a lot more devices in the room. You may have, you know, a phone, a, a computer, as well as a tablet. The kids may each have their own device, et cetera, that all need to get out there. So you can quickly overwhelm that access point. The other problem is, is again, users are bringing their own devices. A lot of those are gonna be inexpensive devices that don't have very good Wi-Fi power output. And they can't get the signal from where the bed is, for instance, through the wall, through the bathroom fixtures, through that reflective mirror, through the pipes, through the wall out into the hall, and then down the hall to where the access point is. So even if you're doing umbrella coverage, you're no longer doing 16 or eight rooms, you're doing you know, max four rooms, depending on your size, construction, et cetera, like that. But the general trend has been to move to these small, lower powered wall plate APs that go in the room. Um, another thing that's changed, obviously, also is the users are much more picky about the quality of their Wi-Fi. Um, there's been surveys out there showing that the number one complaint guests tend to have has to do with Wi-Fi. If the Wi-Fi isn't good enough, guests are going to complain. They're going to leave your, you negative reviews. So that's why a lot of the hotels make, to make it really sure that they've got good, strong Wi-Fi. Um, so as you move to these individual lower powered APs in the room, well, now the signal from your guests doesn't have to go through walls and fixtures and things like that. So every user gets a very good experience. These wall plate APs, many of them, also have some additional features that make them really popular in these hotel deployments. So a lot of your newer hotels now, right? You've got, then you have a connection coming into the room and they may be doing a VoIP phone in the room and they're using a TV, which is using some form of a smart IP TV um, to get the TV signal in there. So these wall plate APs generally have pass-through ports on them. So ethernet PoE power comes in from you know, the central switch it provides the Wi-Fi access, and then you run a cable from that access point to your uh, IP phone in the room, um, and it can pass through the PoE to that device, so it powers up, and then you've got another cable going from that access point that plugs into a, you know, a set-top box or into the TV directly um, to provide your IP TV for the room. So now you're, instead of running a phone connection and an ethernet connection and coax to the room, you're running one piece of CAT5e or CAT6 to the room, plugging it into your access point, and then going from that access point to the other devices. So you've dramatically you know, reduced the amount of cables that have to be run to the rooms and simplified the wiring and power for devices. So that's another reason why you're seeing most newer builds going for this sort of thing. Um, for some of the cheaper properties, what we're seeing is they'll do one of these for every other room. Um, generally, these wall plate APs are powerful enough and the walls are thin enough that one, one room can cover, you know, one AP can cover, easily cover two rooms. It just depends, you know, in those scenarios, generally you're not doing the IP phone, they're older hotels that are just adding this rather than um, upgrading everything to IP based. So some other things here is, you know, look for locking, lock, locking options. Guests will steal anything that they can, um, so generally you want to make sure that your, your mounting plate, it isn't obvious how to release the device from the mounting plate um, to take it off. Um, and then you, you don't want LEDs to be on. So look for an access point that allows you to turn off the LEDs because when you're tired and you're trying to sleep, you don't want a flashing green light above your head or on the wall where you're trying to sleep. When it comes to public areas, you want to split them off and basically design your Wi-Fi coverage for each individual area. Plan the lobby separate from the hotel bar, separate from the meeting room, separate from the pool area, et cetera. Design your networks for each one of those. Um, and you're primarily going to be looking at user density. How many users are going to be on using the network in that area? And what sort of you know, connections are they going to have? Um, that's what you want to take in mind is, you know, how many users are likely to be on there. So for instance, you may have a lot of people in the hotel bar, but chances are very few of them are going to be actively using the Wi-Fi. Whereas in the hotel lobby, you may have a lot of users there, particularly in the mornings, um, you know, that are that are doing their work emails and stuff while they're waiting for their ride to show up, while they're waiting for their coworkers to get out of breakfast, et cetera. So take that sort of uh, uh, items in mind there. Another thing here is when it comes to load balancing and client steering, be sure your load balancing groups are mapped to the areas that are going to be covered. We have had uh, hotel installers contact us if they were having issues with the quality of the wireless connection. And the reason for that is they had the entire hotel set up as one big load balancing group. 
So you would have an overloaded AP in the lobby trying to push users off to an AP that was on the fifth floor of the building in somebody's room. So you, you're generally, you know, in if you're doing one AP per room or something like that, you won't have any load balancing on those APs. You'll have it turned off. And then when it does come to load balancing, you'll have the load balancing group for the hotel lobby separate from the load balancing group for the conference room, for instance. Um, and so someone earlier we were asking about, you know, how do you deal with these really dense environments? So the, uh, the honest answer here is smart antenna. This is where smart antenna shines is this ability where you've got either a lot of APs crammed into the same area because you've got so many users or where you've just got a lot of users crammed onto a small number of APs. Either way, smart antenna makes a huge difference. We haven't talked about Wi-Fi 6 yet, but Wi-Fi 6 also is designed to sort of deal with these scenarios. Um, and the Wi-Fi 6 technology is complementary to smart antenna. They both go about the same goal of cramming more users or devices into an area using different technologies. So they, they complement each other. Uh, but yeah, generally, anytime you've got a really dense environment, go with smart antenna. Anywhere you don't really have a, a dense environment, you, uh, you could avoid smart antenna unless there's a lot of interference issues in that area. Which leads us into schools and smart schools. So that's one of the first things you're going to ask yourself. One is, how many students are going to be in this room? And the next one is, is you know, what are they doing here? Um, you know, there's a big difference between a classroom, which is more of a traditional classroom where the teacher stands up and lectures and shines something on the screen, versus a classroom that's a smart classroom um, where all of the students are getting on the internet. And there's different levels of smart classroom. So I've seen smart classrooms where, yeah, all 30 students in the room need to get onto the internet, but they're only using the internet to take tests or to write papers or do some research during study time versus smart classrooms where the teacher is streaming video files to each individual user's Chromebook. So instead of all the students watching their educational video on the wall, they're all watching it on their own individual Chromebook, right? So that obviously uses a lot more bandwidth than the other smart classroom scenarios. So, you, know, you, you just got to quiz and find out for each room, how is it planning to be used and then design based around that. In general, um, we try to say that if a class is above 20 students, put two APs in the room. Um, and if there's 30 or more students in the room, we highly recommend using smart antennas, uh, APs that have that smart antenna technology. Um, and we do have in our Nebula and in our uh, local controller, we actually have a special load balancing mode that's designed for classrooms that recognizes that, you know, classrooms are a really interesting environment because you'll go from having no users on the network to having, you know, 30 users on the network within just a few seconds. Um, so we've got a special load balancing algorithm that's specifically designed for that type of scenario. Okay, so now we'll start talking about Wi-Fi 6. And I, I split this out um, because Wi-Fi 6 is basically the first real attempt that's been made at solving those issues that we've been talking about up to this point. Again, everything up to this point has been based off that, you know, 1997 Wi-Fi standard. Um, and Wi-Fi 6 is the first attempt to try to rewrite a lot of the cores of Wi-Fi um, to solve some of these issues we've been talking about, um, while also still kind of sort of maintaining backwards compatibility. So originally Wi-Fi 6, aka 802.11ax, was marketed as high efficiency Wi-Fi, because that's where the focus was. And by high efficiency, it means lots of users on an access point, lots of access points in an area, right? Those, those scenarios that have been so difficult for Wi-Fi up until this point. Now, a really cool key thing here with Wi-Fi 6 is Wi-Fi 6 works on all frequencies. It works on 2.4, it works on 5, and it works on 6. Now, the hardware needs to support those channels, but the protocol itself works on all three. And this is a really big deal because 11AC technology only worked on the 5 gigahertz radio. Your, uh, your 11 AC access point, your 11 AC router, that 2.4 router or 2.4 radio is still 11 N, right? 11 N is really old. Um, so it's a huge performance boost for your 2.4 radio. 
assuming that your access point actually has Wi-Fi 6 on both radios. Um, and it's just added higher QAM so we can uh, encode more data on there. It adds OFDMA, which allows us to better chunk up the available Wi-Fi or the available airtime spectrum between users. So instead of being stuck on 20 megahertz channels, we can now have flexibility to designate for say a smart plug, just two megahertz of available airtime while giving your fire stick or smart TV, you know, 80 or 85, you know, megahertz of airtime. Um, so it's optimized based on what the demand of the individual device is. So it allows you to cram a lot more users on there because you don't have unused spectrum there. And it allows multi-user MIMO from the client devices up to the access point. So now you can have multiple clients transmitting at the same time, not causing interference issues. And they've added technology here called spatial frequency reuse, which um, has basically ways of tagging the packets that you're transmitting with who they're intended for, which allows the radios to ignore data that isn't intended for them. And there's also been some changes to um, how it determines whose turn it is to broadcast. The AP can now schedule that. So instead of users fighting over the airtime and just try, you know just relying on listening and saying, well, is it my turn, is it my turn? Your access point can say, this is the time when it's gonna be your turn. So the Wi-Fi 6 standard itself first got approved all the way back in 2020. It wasn't officially approved until Q1. And a lot of products that came out before this are missing some of the features. They just aren't there. And you do also still see it with some of the newer products that are using some of the, the cheaper chipsets. You know, some of these features like upstream MUMIMO weren't part of the Wi-Fi Alliance certification until January of 2022. Um, you know, almost a year after the official cert product was certified in, you know, what, two and a half, three years after some of the first products billing themselves as Wi-Fi 6 came out. So just some things to take take into mind here. Um, you know, a lot of products out there um, are still using the old chips, the, the rush to market. Um, some of the ingenious products, for instance, are using the old Gen 1 chips that are missing some of these key Wi-Fi 6 features. Um, and then some vendors, Ubiquity is an example of this, only put Wi-Fi 6 on their five gigahertz radios on some models. So you're buying a product that's advertised as Wi-Fi 6, but when you look a little bit closer, what you see is that the 2.4 radio is still 11N based technology, right? So Wi-Fi 4 technology. Um, so for Zycel, at least, we, we make this simple for you. All of our business class access points that are, so those are gonna be NWA models and WAX models that have at least three numbers in the naming are going to be the full Wi-Fi 6 feature set and are going to be Wi-Fi 6 on both radios. Some of our low sumer, the low end prosumer Soho type stuff um, may only have, may not have all the Wi-Fi 6 features enabled, but all of our business class access points. So again, you know, the NWA 110AX, WAX 510D, et cetera, et cetera. All of those Wi-Fi 6 um, business class access points, full Wi-Fi 6 feature set, Wi-Fi 6 on both radios for Zycel products. So now another technology you may have heard of here is Wi-Fi 6E. So again, one of the problems we're running into here, right, is, is we've been increasing the channel bandwidth is five gigahertz doesn't look as big as it used to. So there was this huge chunk of six gigahertz spectrum that was out there. It already had people using it, but it wasn't used that much. So the FCC about a year ago decided to open this up and allow users to use this for Wi-Fi. It gives us 2.5 times more capacity as far as the available bandwidth that we can use. It provides for those 160 megahertz channels, seven non-overlapping 160 gigahertz channels. Um, and in general, right, the only thing that's using the six gigahertz space is these Wi-Fi 6E products. So you don't have to worry about interference. So there's just a little graph here. Here's your 2.4 spectrum. Here's your five gigahertz spectrum. And you see six gigahertz is bigger than both of those combined. So it's a tremendous amount of available space. This is going to be a boon probably for conference rooms, expo centers, stadiums, places like that because you've got a lot more non-overlapping channels that you can cram users onto. 
So it's not all roses though. So we do have Wi-Fi 6 products available today. They are out there for you if you or your customers want them. So like with Wi-Fi 5, or excuse me, like with 5 gigahertz, 6 gigahertz was already being used by some people and they're still using it. So because of that, they're going to need to be a technology similar to DFS um, for operation on 6 gigahertz. Now, the good news is, is that um, these are outdoor technologies, not indoor technologies. So you don't have to worry about this when it comes to your indoor Wi-Fi 6E deployments. Unfortunately, these are outdoor stuff. So this new technology similar to DFS, but it's supposed to be getting improved, um, is gonna be required to use 6E outdoors. So technically, legally, you cannot operate a 6E access point outside. Um, and we're still waiting for the FCC to tell us what this new upgraded and improved version of DFS is going to be available for us to implement it. So we are still waiting and waiting. And part of the reason why we are waiting and waiting all this time is the FCC has been sued by the existing six gigahertz consumers um, or users um, who don't want Wi-Fi to operate on those same frequencies. So we're having to wait for the FCC to finalize how they're going to uh, solve these uh, cooperating issues here. And we're stuck waiting for the legal, legal stuff to, uh, to be finalized. So we had originally planned to launch outdoor Wi-Fi 6E products this fall. And we have no idea when we are going to be able to launch those products um, because of this regulatory issue. So who knows when outdoor 6E is going to be available. So for right now, 6E is indoors. And part of the reason why 6E can be an indoor product is because six gigahertz is higher than five gigahertz, which means it doesn't like to go very far and it doesn't like to pass through solid objects. So that means when you're using 6E indoors, there's very little bleed out of your building into the outdoor space, which is why you don't need um, automatic frequency control for indoor 6E utilization. But it also means less range, so you're going to need more access points to cover the same area. And you can go pull up any sort of 6E reviews, and that's going to be one of the big complaints. You will notice a difference in coverage between 6 gigahertz clients and 5 gigahertz clients. 5 gigahertz getting a lot better coverage. I'll give you an example from my home. Um, a centrally located 5 gigahertz AP gives me full coverage for my house. Uh, maybe not at the speeds I want for gaming or the reliability I want for gaming, but decent solid connection for working from. For six gigahertz, no. For six gigahertz, I've had to put two APs in, one at each end of my house, and it's still less than ideal for what I would want. Uh, it's, it's usable, but it, it's less than I would want. So that just gives you an idea. Um, some of the other problems you've got with six gigahertz, right, is there's not a lot of client devices that support it today. So when you're deploying six gigahertz, you're more doing it as a future proofing scenario for your customer um, rather than something that's actually going to see much utilizations right away today. Um, you know, we're, we're still seeing, you know, 11 uh, Wi-Fi 6. There's still not a lot of just plain Wi-Fi 6 support out there. A lot of products are still using AC. Um, when it comes to smart home, a lot of products are still using 802.11b or G. So that's, that's gonna be another issue here for us. The other one that we've got, I don't have it up here on the slide, is that seven, Wi-Fi seven, remember that first slide I showed you guys, um, Wi-Fi seven is just around the corner. Um, so Wi-Fi seven, I don't have any slides on it today because it's out there and the standard hasn't been published yet. But the idea behind Wi-Fi seven primarily is even greater channels. Um, so instead of 160, uh, megahertz channels, doubling it again um, to 320 megahertz channels. And then again, from there, um, the other benefit is allowing you to use, for instance, five gigahertz and six gigahertz at the same time for the same client device. So you can have your aggregated 320 megahertz channel um, coexisting over both five gigahertz and six gigahertz simultaneously. Some of it will come from five, some of it will come from six. Um, so it's really focused on throughput. We are talking up to uh, 30 gigabits per second data rates. So it's gonna be really, really fast. 
So that's going to be one of those things, though, where I think a lot of people are going to wait um, before moving to six gigahertz until Wi-Fi seven is out there. Um, so that's something else to keep in mind when it comes to 6E is that 7 is just around the corner. Um, you know, I think practically, I don't think many people need the, those massive amounts of bandwidth and those massive amounts of speed. I think that's going to be really limited to like in-room AV applications. Um, but still, people are going to see it. So if you sell somebody a 6E today, um, you know, probably by the end of the year, they're going to start seeing consumer products advertising themselves as Wi-Fi 7 even though realistically Wi-Fi 7 won't get ratified until, uh, until you know, 2020, late 2024, I think at the earliest, maybe even longer, especially uh, Wi-Fi 6 took forever to uh, get officially ratified. So that's it as far as that goes, but I don't want to end this on a negative note for 6E. There are some definite benefits for 6E utilization. Again, we've got a lot of bandwidth that's available there. Um, so it's really ideal for high density deployments. Like I said, this is going to be something that you're probably going to want to use um, in expo centers, convention centers, things like that, because you can cram a bunch of APs in there at full speed without them interfering with each other. And then, of course, they've got the, the same Wi-Fi 6 technology that allows a lot denser deployments than 11AC ever did. The other real big utilization for this is probably going to be wireless backhaul. So you've now got a channel or a big wide open spectrum here to be able to make mesh, I think probably maybe for the first time really workable um, in a business class environment or maybe even in the you know, uh, public hotspot like an expo center type environment where you don't need to run ethernet to each individual device. Instead, you can use six gigahertz backhaul um, between your APs to be able to provide super fast, super reliable backhaul connections um, removing the need to have that ethernet connection directly to the, every single one of your APs. Um, so that, that's another potential area where I think this is gonna be big, especially in the home. It's gonna be really nice to have a full speed five gigahertz connection um, to your AP and then have it be able to make a full speed wireless six gigahertz connection um, as a backhaul. And with that guys, that is the end of the presentation. Um, I haven't seen any more questions come in. So if you've got any more questions, use that question and answer box to send them in. Uh, so just a heads up for everybody here, this will be posted on our YouTube. There are several different uh, Zycel branded YouTube channels, and that's just because we're a global company. Um, so the North American one here for you, our presentations we do here at the uh, US office, um, those will be posted to youtube.com slash Zycel America channel, all one word. So most of our webinars get posted there. Um, it's also where video case studies get posted and other things like that. We are on LinkedIn at Zycel US channel. Um, Barry was asking for a PowerPoint version of this. Um, I don't have access to anybody's emails here, uh, but just reach out to your salesperson. Um, this, you know, that should be either uh, David Chen, um, Jacob, or Andy, whoever your, your sales guy is, just go ahead, reach out to them. They can get you a PowerPoint or a PDF copy of this, not a PowerPoint, they can set you up with a PDF copy of this. Or again, the whole presentation will show up on our YouTube page, um, generally within about 24, 36 hours there for you. Um, I do have one question here, but before I get to that, I do also want to point you to using our um, forum. We have a user forum, forum.zycell.com. We highly encourage you to use those forums. It's a chance for you to reach out and talk to your fellow users and installers. These forums are actually monitored by our R&D and our tech support. Um, so if you have product suggestion ideas and things like that, um, they absolutely do see those, even if they don't necessarily log in to respond to you. I guarantee you here when we're doing, you know, trying to plan out new features and schedules, um, we do absolutely reference those requests. So if you request something and a bunch of other people jump on saying, hey, that's a good idea, it's a good chance that it will get either uh, adopted or at least bumped up in the uh, priority queue. It's also where our um, security notifications and release notes generally get published first. Um, so it's a good resource for you to be using, even if you don't plan to use it to talk to your fellow Zyso users. Okay, we've got some questions in. Let's, let's try to answer these questions. Um, so Andrew is asking here, does the client device send the AP how many spatial streams it has or does it know the number? 
And um, I'm not sure exactly how the handshaking works, but yes, there is handshaking. Um, so the AP knows how much data to send that client or that that, that client can receive. And then when it comes to those uh, WooMimo scenarios, same thing. It will know, okay, this user can only take one stream. This user can take two streams. So it will send two streams to that one device and will simultaneously just use sending one stream, for instance, to that other device. So yes, there is some sort of handshaking that goes on there. How do we properly pronounce Zycel? Good question. The official answer is Zycel. So basically change that X into an S and that's how you get the pronunciation. That comes from the founders of the company. However, um, in Europe, most of the regions there pronounce the name Zizel. Um, and I have heard some regions pronounce it uh, Zizel. So the official from the founders and the way we try to pronounce it here in North America, Zycel. Hope that helps. Um, if you don't have resellers, I mean, if you are not a reseller, um, you would, that's a good question here. I don't know if we're, we share these with end users. We share them with our partners that are part of our partner program. Um, so I don't think we would send you the PDF files for today's presentation, but you can always watch it again on YouTube or send it to people you know. If you are yourself a reseller or installer, I would highly suggest uh, signing up for our partner program, which is free to join. Um, there's an application on our website to do that. Um, you just have to be a reseller and uh, be um, buying our product through one of our distributors. So Ingram Micro, DNH, Target, Cinex, et cetera. So um, is there a good way to measure the data rate of the AP? Um, so whoops, the answer to that is yeah, yeah, there are um, in general, God, I, I haven't messed with it lately. I, I know for sure in the good old days um, where client devices had their own software that ran, any, any client device software would be able to show you the current data rate of the connection. I don't know if that feature is still part of Windows 11 or not. Um, if it's no longer part of Windows 11, there used to be the ability to pull up advanced statistics and it would show you what the current upstream and downstream data rates were. Um, if there's not, there is software out there that does that for you. There are also dedicated software packages out there, both open source and commercial, um, which you can use to do site surveys. And they generally have all sorts of utilities um, that will map out the signal strength and can do speed performance tests upstream and downstream and things like that. So they are out there. I don't have anything specific that uh, I could recommend. And uh, David said he heard it as Zixel. So yeah, no, that is definitely not the way it's supposed to be pronounced here in North America, but all different stuff out there. And like I said, I've heard it from people from different regions. Um, we've even had salespeople here in the North American office who refuse to change their pronunciation of the name. Um, so yeah, there you go. But officially, Zy Sell. Oh, good. Here's one here. How do you optimize handoff for iOS devices between access points? So this is a good one to come up here. Apple is the bane of any Wi-Fi installer's existence. So as I mentioned before, a number of years ago, Apple, for whatever reason, decided to not follow the Wi-Fi standards and made their own modifications to the Wi-Fi standards. I assume at one point the, you know, they had their own AP and that was sort of their idea to give them a little benefit for other uh, Apple users. But it caused all sorts of compatibility issues back in the day. Um, then I mentioned another one that's still lingering is for whatever reason, certain Apple devices do not like to connect to certain five gigahertz channels. And another one we run into here, probably the most common complaint we get ever um, when it comes to you know Wi-Fi things is iOS roaming. iOS devices will connect to an access point and they will hold on to that access point for dear life regardless of how weak that access point signal gets and regardless of how many other nearby or how how many other access points they've gotten close to that have a much stronger signal um, so it causes them basically the or i guess a short way of putting this is they don't like to roam they like to connect to one device and stick to that device no matter what happens so when it comes to that, the best way of dealing with that that I have found, um, there are some sort of fast roaming standards, 802.11 KV and R, 
um, which may help or should help, but I think realistically don't when it comes to Apple devices. Um, so what you do instead is you go into your settings for your AP and you set a minimum signal strength threshold for that AP. So basically if it detects a wireless user's signal has dropped below a certain threshold, it boots them off the AP and doesn't allow them to reconnect for, I forget how many milliseconds it is. And in general, that then forces them. Um, in general, what we found is with iOS devices, they will then do a new channel scan, see that there's an AP nearby that's got a stronger signal strength and connect to that. So that's what you have to do. So you, you go in there, it's something that's our, our APs can do, and I'm assuming most other vendors APs can do, is you set that minimum signal strength threshold and you have to play with it, you know, depending on your user scenario, what works best for you. Um, if you reach out to your salesperson, our channel sales engineer has probably got a, a, you know, a generic starting point to start at, um, but it's something you play around with and it, it helps a lot with those sticky devices that don't want to roam. Um, just Rusty had a comment here on the general rule we have used is 2.4 for range and five gigahertz for streaming. And that, that's, that's yeah, largely the case. Um, and I don't see any other questions, but I'll stick around for just another minute here um, to see if anyone else is typing something up. Uh, but I appreciate you guys turning up for today's webinar. Again, this has been recorded. So if you had to step away, you will be able to find it again. Uh, we've got a bunch of other webinars on all different topics. Uh, I cover webinars primarily on wireless products and our cloud networking. Try, uh, he covers uh, webinars on our security products and switches. And then for those of you looking for a more technical sales presentation, our sales engineer, Marcus, um, uh, he puts together a number of presentations for that. And I think some of our sales guys put on their own trainings as well. And most of those will be archived and loaded up on our YouTube channel. Okay, I've got no questions coming in, so I appreciate that, guys. I'm going to go ahead and end today's webinar. Thank you.